Hi there everyone and welcome back to the channel. I hope you enjoyed my previous video on the construction design management regulations and some key parts of it. Today's video will be focusing on the duty holders and the documents required. We'll be covering who the duty holders are, what they're required to do and when they're needed. And we'll be looking at the various documents, PCI, CPP, health and safety file. So let's get stuck in. So what and who are the duty holders? The duty holders are members of the project that have responsibilities in relation to health and safety and ensuring they're undertaken competently. Generally, all duty holders must have the skills, knowledge and experience to fulfill the role they're appointed so that health and safety is secured and those making the appointments make sure these requirements are met. Cooperate with all other duty holders on the project or any project on an adjoining site, reporting to the person in control of the works anything they're aware of which is likely to endanger their own health and safety or that of others, and providing information promptly, clearly and in appropriate form. The duty holders include the client, designer, contractor and worker. And for projects involving more than one contractor, you will need a principal designer and a principal contractor. These are in place to plan, manage and monitor the work. If these roles aren't appointed by the client, the responsibilities of each then default to the client. It's worth noting that a single contractor project has no other subcontractors involved to qualify. If electric work is subcontracted, that counts or if scaffolding is subcontracted, that still counts. And that would be considered a multiple contractor project and you would need a principal designer and a principal contractor. A key part of appointment of duty holders is ensuring the right people are appointed. Competency is usually assessed during the procurement and tendering phase. It's possible to utilize PAS 91, a publicly available specification for pre-qualification questionnaires, which includes core criteria for health and safety. The assessments will determine whether those proposed to be appointed can demonstrate they have the necessary capability and resources and sufficient skills to fulfill their role. So let's go through each duty holder. It's worth highlighting before we start a quality resource that I'll leave down in the description. On the CITB website there are specific guides for each duty holder. So first up, the client. The client is an individual or organisation for whom the construction work is carried out. Under CDM, the client is accountable for the impact that their decisions have on the health and safety of the project. It is important to understand that these responsibilities cannot be novated. The client will decide what is to be constructed, where, when and who by, be at the head of the procurement process, and commission the design and construction work. It's worth noting that there are two types of client. This is domestic and commercial. The key difference is that a domestic client generally has their responsibilities taken on by the contractor or principal contractor. The duties of the client include appointing the other duty holders as early as possible, ensuring sufficient time and resources are allocated for each stage of the project, ensuring notification to HSE if applicable, and that plans are working in practice, making sure that the principal designer and principal contractor carry out their duties and that plans are working in practice throughout the pre-con and con phases, ensuring a CPP has been prepared by the contractor and ensuring a clear brief and PCI is prepared. Next up is the designer. Designers, as the name suggests, prepare or modify a design for any part of the construction project. The role of the designer can extend to other parties if they make a design-related decision. For example, the role may extend to a contractor if they're advising on the use of a particular material, or may well extend to myself as a project manager if I have input on the design. Their duties are not to start any design work unless the client is aware of their CDM duties, take into account PCI when preparing designs, and where possible, eliminate reduce and control risks that could arise during the remaining project phases, providing information to and cooperating with the other members of the project team to help them fulfill their duties such as communicating risks to the principal designer and other duty holders. So next up is the principal designer. The principal designer is the designer but where there is more than one contractor on the project. On top of the designer role they have further duties. These are centered around coordination of information and preparation of documentation during the pre-construction phase. They plan and manage and monitor health and safety in pre-construction phase, assist the client in identifying and obtaining and collating the PCI, provide the PCI info to designers, the principal contractor and contractors, oversee design to ensure foreseeable risks are eliminated or reduced, they ensure designers comply with duties and cooperate with each other, they also liaise with the principal contractor for the duration of the construction phase to ensure design and design change is coordinated in that phase. They also prepare the health and safety file upon completion of the project. Next up is the principal contractor. The duties of the principal contractor are analogous to that of the principal designer, but in the construction phase. And these are 
planning, managing and monitoring health and safety in the construction phase, liaising with the client and principal designer, preparing the CPP before the site is set up, organising the cooperation between contractors and coordinating their work, and to ensure site inductions take place. They must take reasonable steps to prevent unauthorised access, they must ensure workers are consulted and engaged in securing their safety, and must ensure that welfare facilities are provided. Next up is the contractor. The contractor are those who do the actual construction work. This includes anyone that is doing, managing, or in control of construction work, as well as anyone who directly engages with it. Their duties are not to start any construction work unless the client is aware of their duties, planning, managing, and monitoring of construction work under their control so that it is done without risks to health and safety. For projects with more than one contractor, they must coordinate activities with others in the team, whilst also complying with directions given to them by the principal designer or principal contractor. If they are the only contractor, they must prepare a construction phase plan and they must provide works under their control with appropriate and sufficient supervision, instructions and information and PPE. They are also not to start unless steps have been taken to prevent unauthorised access to sites and provide suitable welfare facilities. So, last but not least, the workers. Workers duties include be consulted about matters which affect their safety, take care of their own health and safety and their actions, report anything they see which is likely to endanger them or others' safety, cooperate with the employer and with other duty holders. Like I said, there's a guide on the CITB website um, which outlines each duty holder. It has its own PDF, it's really clear and really useful. I've used that to inform this video along with my own firm's training sessions and my own knowledge. Right, now we've covered the duty holders, who they are and what they do. Let's talk about the documentation required under CDM. There are four key documents and these are the client brief, the pre-construction information, the construction phase plan, and the health and safety file. Let's start with the client brief. This allows the client to articulate what they want, as well as help carry out their duties under CDM. A good client brief is key to the success of any project. It is the vision of the project. It includes key requirements and aims. It is key to show the other duty holders how to approach their project and shapes their plan. A good client brief will include information about time and budget and should outline the health and safety expectations. Although this document isn't actually required under CDM like the others, the client duty holder Holder has responsibilities to assist those designing or using the structure. Doing this early in the form of the client brief clearly shows attentions and efforts are being paid to fulfill the client duties and its best practice. The second document is the pre-construction information or PCI. The PCI is critical to a safe project. It provides health and safety information to the designers and contractors to be able to carry out their work and critical information to the principal designers and principal contractors to be able to plan, monitor, and coordinate the work. It provides a basis for the construction phase plan, the next document we'll be talking about, and some information may be relevant for the health and safety file. The client is responsible for providing the PCI as soon as is practicable, and where appointed, the principal designer must assist the client in its provision. The information in the PCI is defined as information about the project that is already in the client's possession or which is reasonably obtainable by them. The information must be relevant to the project, have appropriate detail and proportionate given the nature of the health and safety risk involved. It's best practice for the PCI to be developed as a live document as the design develops. This is because new risks can be uncovered as time progresses throughout the project. The information available at the start the project may not be sufficient where further design and investigation is undertaken. So next up, the construction phase plan. The CPP is a document that records how health and safety is to be approached and managed during the construction phase of a project. It is the basis for communicating these arrangements for all those involved in the project, so it must be easy to understand and as simple as possible. The CPP is prepared by the contractor or the principal contractor if there's more than one contractor on the project and is to include details of the works being done as well as the project team and emergency arrangements. The information must be project specific and it needs to address safety issues that are presented by the work, as well as details about how that risk is going to be removed, mitigated or managed. Now it's important to understand that CPP is different to a risk assessment or method statement and as with the PCI, the CPP should be a live document that is updated throughout the project, as new information or other works that were not planned previously are incorporated into the project, potentially. The CPP should include project description, project management, arrangements for control of safety risks, arrangements for control of health risks, and arrangements for gathering information for the health and safety file. 
And that segues nicely onto our final document, the health and safety file. The purpose of the health and safety file is to provide relevant information to anyone wishing to safely undertake construction works to the premises in the future. That includes maintenance, cleaning, refurbishment or demolition. The health and safety file is only required on projects that have more than one contractor. Although in my experience it is common to see them requested by clients regardless of the number of contractors on site. And in my experience, this happened with one retail client for all the projects that we worked on. The health and safety file is prepared by the principal designer and is provided to the client in REBA stage six or handover. If the principal designer's appointment ends before the end of the construction project, then the responsibility to provide the file is then transferred to the principal contractor. Side note, let me know down in the comments if you'd like to see a video on all the various REBA stages and what they entail. The health and safety file should include a brief description of the works, any hazards that could not be removed through design and construction process and the management measures taken, structural information and working loads for roofs and floors, hazardous materials used, information regarding the removal or dismantling of installed plant and equipment, necessary health and safety information for maintenance and cleaning, and as-built drawings. As with all the documents, it must be concise and clear. It must also only be relevant to the project, and information included must only be relevant for the future purposes of construction, cleaning, maintenance, refurbishment, and demolition. Right, folks, that's all. I really enjoyed doing this episode today, getting into the nitty-gritty of CDM as part of a series of videos that I'm doing on health and safety. I do have to note that this is just a compilation of my own research. Please do not take any of it as professional advice, and I encourage you to go out and do your own research too. And the information is by no means comprehensive. It's just parts that I think you need to know, the, the important part. So yeah, stay tuned for future videos. The next videos will be on control of asbestos, which will be a two-parter. I will do future videos following that on CSCS, the various health and safety legislation, general site risks, and more as part of this series. Now, if you think I've missed something key today, please leave it down in the comments, as I will be reading them. And as always, I'm sure that I'll learn something new. Thanks for watching. Consider giving this video a like if you enjoyed, and subscribing if you would like to see more.